Hey, welcome to the 220th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patrons Nathan Blackwell and Nathan Presley, our two longest-running patrons. Thanks, guys. I'm Matt Unlow. And I'm Warren Kaplan. And today we have Paul Scanlon on the podcast. He is one of the founders of Legion M, a company that is doing some awesome things. They're producing a bunch of movies, some which you may have heard of, like Colossal with Anne Hathaway and Jason Sudeikis, Mandy with Nicolas Cage, Save Yourself. So we had the filmmakers on the podcast. It's a really, really awesome thing they're doing. You can actually invest in Legion M and be and own some shares in the company if you are interested in it and even have some sway on the movies they make. I don't know if they will make your movie tomorrow, but from our conversation with Paul, it sounds like they really do care about their movie fans that are part owners of the company. I thought it was a really good conversation. I bet a lot of our listeners have been aware of them for a while now. You know, they, they've been lurking around. You see a press release, you see, you know, oh, they're behind this movie or that movie. And I was just truly curious about the inner workings and like how it all works and how, frankly, how legit it feels. People say like, oh, we're powered by the fans or it's democratized or this or that. You know, we've seen that a bunch of times. Talking with Paul, it seems pretty cool and pretty legit. And certainly they are doing their very best to put their money where their mouth is in terms of being transparent and kind of cracking open the gatekeeping behind Hollywood. It's a really fascinating conversation. Legion M is like fan fueled in a way, you know, and they are really experts at using like crowdfunding and they kind of bring like a very entrepreneurial Silicon Valley tech startup kind of attitude to like how to build communities around a business and how to make cool movies at the same time. It, it's something that that's truly really interesting. I think you'll really enjoy our chat with Paul before we chat with Paul and before we catch up, I just want to mention, so our, our oldest patron is Nathan Presley. He's given a dollar per month and he's donated $50 over his lifetime. So if you don't want to do the math, he's been a patron since April 26th, 2018. Uh, Nathan Blackwell, the other Nathan, also $50, but he joined April 29th. So he's actually in third place because between the two of them, we have Ryan Moulton. He's at a higher level. So he's giving us a lot more money. He's, uh, he's paid almost for... Uh, full month of editing. So Ryan Moulton, Nathan Presley, Nathan Blackwell, 2018 OG patrons. They've been with us for over four years. And uh, maybe we'll mention some of our other OG patrons. Can you guess who number four is? He also has a podcast. Jordan Brady. Respect the process. Thanks, Jordan. Appreciate it, buddy. Shout out to Chris Wilde too. But but we'll, we'll get to all of these people. There's a lot of great patrons in the archive and I want them to feel appreciated. If you want to check out our Patreons, patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. You can give us a dollar, five dollars a month, whatever you want. If you give us fifteen dollars even for one month, we'll send you a just shoot it podcast hat. While we're at it, I'm going to throw another wrench. I'm going to say my favorite patron level is the is the dollar a month. I just want like kind of something that's not going to bother anyone. No one's going to be like, oh, I need to turn this off. How much money am I spending or whatever? You just kind of let it go on in the background and it just kind of is a nice little heartbeat for the show. We do appreciate the contribution. So like 10 $1 a month patrons is frankly more exciting to me than one $10 a month patron. We love them all. We love them all. Oren. Yes. I need to know. So do the listeners at home. What have you been working on lately? Well, I've been working on a lot of fun stuff. I have a shoot coming up on the 6th and 7th. We actually have a listener. I'm actually, I'm going to throw another wrench into this. We have a listener that sent me a message that said, Hey, I heard on the podcast that you're shooting something on July 6th and 7th. I'm going to be in LA. Can I come help you? He's done a bunch of shorts, some other things. I think maybe some branded stuff, but he's only been on his own sets where he's oh, a director. Sure. Yeah, he yeah, wants yeah. to be on other people's sets. He wants um, to shadow, basically. Yeah. Or he's like, I'll carry C-stands. I'll get coffee. I'll do whatever mm-hmm. you want. But it's, I'm curious, and I, I'm sure he's listening, and I have not responded to you. I, I actually did forward your information on to our producer, but I just want to be honest, and I think this might be interesting to our listeners. Like, when I get a request like that, it's one thing if you're like, I want to learn about the business. Do you have kind of like a smaller thing I can PA on? Because usually if it's like a bigger thing and we have three PAs, we're going to have three PAs. We want them all to have a lot of experience doing PA stuff because we're actually going to count on them. Yeah, you, to, need, you need great PAs. Yeah. Yeah. They need to be really good at things like finding restaurants, you know, to go get this, the actor mm-hmm. some weird thing they want. They need to be really good at whatever trash 
uh, packing director's mm-hmm. chairs into trucks, whatever, all those random things. And more importantly, whether they're this person is awesome at being a PA or not, kind of doesn't matter. The reason that they want to be on set is to watch you work and kind of get that sense. A very good PA oftentimes isn't around the director enough to really glean a ton of information about their process, right? So if the goal is, hey, I've only ever been on my own sets and I want to see how you do it, being a PA is probably not, you're not in the crow's nest, so to speak. Right. So on one hand, I appreciate being told like, hey, I've only been on my own sets and and having the curiosity to see how other people work, which is, you know, a lot of the reason we have this podcast is because we don't get to work with other directors much. Um, But on the other hand, it makes me feel like any job that we actually need to be done will not be satisfying Mm -hmm. (laughs) for uh, this listener. And if I just brought the listener on to do a job we don't need, it's already kind of like a difficult shoot with like very young children and trying to have like minimal people on set and all these other things. It's not that it would like bug me really, but I'd have to like kind of explain why I want them on set to the client, to the agency, to mm-hmm. the, this, like to the producer, why are they here? Why are we paying to feed them lunch? You know, what do you recommend in, in this situation? Look, it's tricky. And I think it's worth it to kind of maybe take a step back and talk less specifically about this person and more about this sort of scenario in general, because it does happen, you know, your friend's niece was in from town and really wants to get into the business or, you know, your college reaches out and says, hey, we really want to pair you with this person. There's a lot of different ways that this can happen. And I do want to say that this is like because they're a listener and because they're filmmakers themselves, it's I think it's even like a more substantial thing than like, hey, my niece wants to see what the film business is like, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, like it's someone that's already you already know they're serious about. They're serious. Work. You're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To- totally. Totally. But I guess there's a couple moves. My instinct is to say like, hey, are you okay with like some sort of unpaid internship shadow sort of situation? And then you can say to the company like, hey, I've got a person who's here to help me out. He's kind of acting like my assistant, but he's really here to learn a lot of stuff as well. He's only part time. He's going to swing by. The reason I say assistant is not because you actually want him to take notes for you or roll calls or go get you a coffee or whatever. It's because that is a term that people in Hollywood immediately understand and acknowledge as like, oh, you don't have a specific production job, but you do need to be here. But also we can ask you to move out of the way or something if we need to. You're not the the son of the president of the company. You know, like you don't have to treat this person with kid gloves, but also you don't have the authority or means to like ask them to go on fire watch and watch the truck or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But tell me from your point of view, if you got this message from someone that you truly do want to help. Yeah. 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 And it's not like I, I don't mean to sound like I'm I'm being so generous or anything. Yeah, you, but you want to do them a solid. You want to do them a solid and you appreciate their interests and whatnot. But at the same time, when you, Matt, are directing and then you have this other person, that you know, they're also a filmmaker and have directed a bunch of things and they're kind of shadowing you. And you're like, hmm, should we put the camera over here, over here to the DP? And they're like, Ooh, I think you could put it over here. Like, how would that make you feel? That is utterly inappropriate. If that happened to you on set, you wouldn't say to them, uh, that's utterly inappropriate. I think you, I think it is actually important for you to be like, not in a way that embarrasses them or calls them out in front of people. I, I think in the moment I would be like, okay, great. You were trying to work on this stuff together. Thank you so much for your input. Or maybe something a little bit more polite than that. Mm -hmm. And then I would pull them aside and be like, hey, listen, I know that you have really great ideas. You don't have all of the information. I invited you here with the implicit understanding that you're here to observe and you're stepping on toes if you speak up about this stuff. And it's not that your ideas aren't good, but there's a chain of command and there's weeks and weeks of work that went into me understanding and that, that informs my decisions. So even though your pitch is maybe good or maybe not, you just don't have enough information. So I just need you to listen. And that's that. I think if you're saying like, oh, should I establish ground rules beforehand? Yeah, I think so. Like what, what does a director get from having a shadow, a shadow on set? It's, it's purely just paying it forward. It's purely like it is work and a hindrance, frankly. 
Like mm-hmm. to have somebody looking over your shoulder, to have somebody that you have to explain why they're there. Literally any person who doesn't have a job to do on set is in the way. Full right. stop. Even if they're super knowledgeable and know exactly where to stand and where to be. What if I have him be an extra because we're shooting all these office scenes? You could do that. Then he's adding a little bit of value. That's a great idea. And then there's also a person who's there to kind of help tell him where to stand and all of that stuff. I think. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, if he's like, you want me to help carry the sandbags? We can be like, sure. You know, or no, Uh, no, absolutely not. Because I think the reason I thought you were going to bring this up is that like, there are real insurance implications to having a person who's not supposed to be on set on set. Like there is paperwork that should be filled out. Well, I'll see if I can maybe get him in as an extra. I think that's the ticket. Or to see if he wants to come by. I think the extra move is great because then he's doing you a favor and also has proximity to kind of see how other things are going. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. And he has a reason to be there that I don't need to. Like he's adding value in a way. Yeah. You don't have to explain anything to anyone. Yeah. Okay. Without any further ado, remind people patreon.com slash the pod if you want to support us. And let's hop into the show. Cool. We are here with Paul Scanlon of Legion M. How you doing? Thanks for joining us. Good. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. Yeah. Paul, for the uninitiated, give us the quick pitch for what Legion M is. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So Legion M, I mean, we describe it as the world's first fan-owned entertainment company. And what we mean by that is literally, we are, you know, a production company growing to be a studio, ultimately, from day one, through all the way through, you know, our full incarnation is designed to be owned by fans. And what we mean by that is people that are passionate about entertainment and want to see new original IP and discover new voices and new talent. And so we started it about six years ago. Only six years. Yeah, it's just been about six years and it's gone quickly. What does the M stand for? The M has a bar over it, which is a Roman numeral for 1 million. Our long-term goal is to unite 1 million entertainment fans and then take over Hollywood. And if you think about that for a minute, so, you know, and we built it into our logo for that reason. We want everyone that's joining Legion M and and being a part of our movement to understand that, you know, this, we are very interested in, you know, the value and the the opportunity that we can create, you know, as a a group of 50,000 investors or 100,000 investors. But we're also really ambitious. We feel like this is an opportunity, maybe a once in a lifetime opportunity to really, you know, add value to this industry that we all love. And, you know, today the average investor puts like $400. We tell anyone considering an investment, you know, we're an entertainment company and Mm -hmm. a startup at the same time. That's like double jeopardy on the risk factor. So look, when we started it, you know, my co-founder, Jeff Anderson, I mean, he and I, you know, it was kind of an experiment, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like, like you guys, when you started your podcast, you didn't know, right? You wanted to go do it and see how it would turn out. And this was the same thing. We said, look, we believe this company should exist and it would be amazing if it did. This would be a company that we would want to be a part of. And so, you know, we put it out there and, uh, you know, six years later, it's been absolutely incredible. I mean, we're so excited. We still have a long way to go. You know, we're in the, like I would say, if this is a baseball game, we're still in the third inning, mm-hmm. uh, but we're in the game. You know, we've got, you know, a couple of runs on the board and and we're feeling really good. Uh, but we still, you know, we still have a long way to go. But it's it, it's been amazing. And the community that that is supporting us is just, you know, fantastic. You said runs on the board. I assume that refers to a handful of movies that people love and enjoy and have graced the screen. So you, you want to give us the hit list real quick of the movies you, you guys have been a part yeah, of? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, well, our first movie, one of the movies I'm personally most proud of, and we, we got involved in that movie later. We, we, we came in when Neon bought the film, but it's a movie called Colossal, mm-hmm. starring Anne Hathaway and Jason Sudeikis, Nacho Vigalando is the director, and Tim League from uh, Alamo Drafthouse is uh, one of our, Alamo Drafthouse and Neon, he's one of our 
advisors. And early on, we got involved in that film because it represented exactly the kind of project that Legion M wants to be <laughs> involved in. Something that's wildly original without a company like Neon or Legion M and you know, companies like this, it might be hard for a movie like that to actually exist because the major studios, you know, it's not, doesn't have a built in audience, doesn't, you know, it's got cast. But so I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick to answer your question. We've had, we've had a couple other big hits. So Mandy, uh, our Nick Cage movie with the fever dream, Mandy, that, that movie is, is probably, you know, one of the gifts that, that keeps giving for us. It's, you know, Panos, we think is just an absolute visionary. So we, we invested in that company. As Panos a, is the director. Yeah, he's the director. And Nick Cage is the lead. Uh, Andrea Riseborough. Uh, it's got a great cast. You know, that's a movie that we made an investment in. But as we've grown and we've kind of progressed, we've gone from, you know, making investments in projects, kind of what we would describe buying our a seat at the table with some, you know, ROI and upside uh, potential to earning a seat at the table. Now we're producing our own projects. You know, mm -hmm. we have a slate of maybe 30, probably 30 projects in our slate, wow. you know, multiple movies. We have a movie and that's just reaching picture lock right now, going into post-production that we produced. It was kind of a wholly owned or, you know, developed by us. That movie starring Sean Astin, Ali Larder, Madison Wolf. And so, you know, we're we're at a point now where we're taking on a bigger role, but we're also mm -hmm. getting into bigger projects. And, you know, we just finished shooting a movie out in Leeds uh, called Nandor Fodor and the Talking Mongoose. I don't know if you've heard about this movie at all. No, that sounds like excellent, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It's such a cool story. That's got Simon Pegg and Minnie Driver uh, and Christopher Lloyd uh, in the cast and you know, that movie is in, in, you know, we, we wrapped shooting about a month ago. So it's, you know, it's deep into production now and we're hoping to finish it by the end of the year. You said your average investor put in $400 into Legion M. Yep. Yep. What do they get for that $400? Yeah. So it, it depends on what, when they invested. So they're buying shares. So, you know, every investor and even every member, you know, by being a part of Legion M, you get you know, inside behind the scenes access, right? Um, but if you're if you're invested, then you literally own the company. And we're SEC regulated. All the investments get managed through a funding portal. Um, we do audited financials every year. And the goal, so as an investor, like today we're not paying dividends or anything. I and mean, mm -hmm. we're we're very focused on growth. Um, ultimately in the future, if we were wildly successful, we might pay dividends. Um, but the ROI from them, you know, comes in two components. One is the appreciation on the shares themselves. So the share, you know, when you buy a share, when we, the first shares we sold, sold for $7. Now in our last round, which we, which we sold out, it was our biggest and fastest round that we've ever had. Uh, shares were selling at $15. So the people that bought shares at $7 have already, you know, I guess recognized some ROI, but you know, there's no way to really sell the shares. They're still like, you're still mm -hmm. kind of acting like a venture capitalist. You own shares in a startup. Our goal is to make that startup is worth, you know, as much money to turn it into a big studio um, ultimately, and then take it public so that the shares are not worth $15, but they're worth, you know, hundreds of dollars, if, if not more. Yeah. You know, for our community, you know, what we what we call their ROI, like what do they get is a combination of financial ROI, which we were always really careful to over promise that like that's not guaranteed. If we're successful, you know, we're a high risk, high reward. So if we're mm -hmm. successful, hopefully that payout will be really nice. Uh, but if we're not, then everyone's going to lose every, every dollar that was put into the company, including ourselves. So, you know, we just want people to understand that. But Along the way, there's a lot of emotional ROI. Like a mm -hmm. lot of our investors have told us, you know, we, we put out polls all the time because we really truly, we don't want them just to invest and be a passive shareholder. We want them actively engaged, you know, mm -hmm. helping us identify projects, helping us, you know, make decisions about projects. We, we have, you know, my co-founder, he and I are kind of Silicon Valley 
media entrepreneurs, I guess you'd call us. And so we're kind of, Leech and M is a mashup of Northern and Southern California where we're building the platform. In Fresno. It's a, yeah, it's Fresno a, of exactly. Ooh, that's, that's a burn. That's a burn. <laughs> Just kidding. Dude, Fresno's great. Uh, <laughs> sure. You heard of Gallo wine? Uh, that's sure. Fresno. <laughs> Fresno chilies are great. Yeah, yeah, uh, anyways. <laughs> uh, wait, so who at the end of the day, so that, that sounds awesome. You get yeah. input from, you have 35,000 investors, mm-hmm. according to the bio. You get input from them. I assume they all get uh, tickets to the premiere of movies like Colossal and stuff. Um, well, we do actually try to, yeah. I mean, so like our last, one of our re- recent premieres, I mean, we, we did it at a drive-in. It was during um, the pandemic. And, you know, we did it, uh, I think more than half the tickets to the premiere went to our community. Oh, so that's pretty awesome. much everybody yeah. that could get to LA and be at the premiere was able to get a ticket. Sounds and like, like a good time. That's for sure. That's that's yeah, really cool. It was. It was good. But at the end of the day, who decides which projects get invested in and how much the spend is? Uh, that's a great question, Oren. But I just I do yeah. want to reiterate the mechanism of investment is through sites like WeFunder, basically. So when you Absolutely. say that it's a person who's investing, we're really talking about like everyday people do you know what i mean you're not you're not logging into your you know uh, schwab account or like calling your broker to to buy shares it's really on a a much more democratized sort of system basically which is i think worth clarifying for people we've raised most of our money on wefunder we've had an absolutely amazing relationship with them we really like their team you know we launched with them i think we did we did eight rounds of investment with them uh, recently, just because Start Engine was courting us for so long, and we mm-hmm. recognized that they're also a really you know valuable player in the space, and so we we did our actually we did seven rounds on WeFunder, and we did the last round on Start Engine. So they're a you know SEC regulated funding portal that is that is enabling this newfound capability for the average investor. And this is something I'm sure when you talk to Johnny, you heard about this that. You know, up until 2016, the only people really legally allowed to invest in startups and mil- movies and, you know, private investments like this were the wealthy elite. And, you know, it's really kind of a kind of a strange phenomenon in, a, in an economy that prides itself with how entrepreneurial we are, that the only people allowed to invest in startups are, you know, already rich. It just seems like crazy. So yeah, yeah. the rule used to be you had to be like a million dollars liquid, basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not yeah. including your home or yeah. make over three hundred thousand dollars for multiple years. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty well. Anyway. So or or and back to your point of like. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess once you've amassed yeah. the, yeah. the this. You've, yeah. You've so now you have all this people, money. Right. Yeah. And you're deciding what movies to invest in, to make, to, to uh, develop, to partner on. How does yeah. that, can you walk us through through that? Yeah, absolutely. So ultimately, you know, we, it's a group of us, small group of us that make the decision. And we make those decisions based on, you know, information that we get from our community and information we get from our board of advisors. So the way we look at it, you know, is the way we set up Legion M is that we built all these tools that help us really understand what does our community want? You know, like our newest movie that we're in picture lock now is a true crime thriller. And the reason it's a true crime thriller is because that was a genre that our community identified as something they would like to see us working. in. And so we were able to find a project and, you know, and, and make that happen. You know, we work with Kevin Smith because our community told us, you know, and we asked them if we could work with any director in Hollywood, you know, Kevin Smith's name just kept coming up at the top of the list. And we happened to have access to him. We'd worked with them before. And, Mm -hmm. you know, when we let him know that, you know, he was over the moon and we, we worked on uh, Jay and Silent Bob reboot together with, uh, with him and his team. And it was amazing. And so our, you know, so we have tools that allow our community to have a voice. Like this is something that is a lot more than just lip service. Like Jeff and I and our team, we truly believe that that is almost as important are more important than the money that people are putting in. I mean, you got to 
you need money to make projects, obviously. Mm -hmm. But knowing what people are interested in or being like, so we have another example. I don't know if you guys have heard about uh, our Film Scout application and what a we do with bit. Film yeah. Scout. Yeah, but walk us through it for sure. Yeah, yeah so Film Scout's really cool. It's kind of like, um, kind of like playing fantasy sports for film nerds. Mm -hmm. Right. So we go to Sundance. We've done it at South by um, we we load up, you know, Film Scott, our app. It's an app that you can download on your phone and uh, it's on Apple and Android. Um, and you play it as a film scouter. Right. So you're a development executive. You're trying to decide, you know, you're you're rating projects based on your own opinion. But then you're also predicting what the overall opinion would be. And that's something that we can rank. That information helps guide us. So we know when we arrive at Sundance, way ahead of like even flying in, we already know of all the descriptions of movies, what is our community most excited about at Sundance? Mm -hmm. And then we invite our community to also be there with us where we'll host a lounge. Sundance, we've done it many years where we're right next to the Egyptian theater at Red Banjo Pizza. Mm -hmm. Our community will come. We'll have, you know, when we started, it was, maybe a couple dozen people. Now it's hundreds of people, potentially even like a thousand people at Sundance playing film scout. They're writing reviews after watching movies. Now all of a sudden we have all this data and that data. So we're not always looking for finished films, but sometimes we are. And when we are, we'll work with a distributor. Like we've worked with neon and screen media and some RLJ and we'll use this data to identify projects that we like that our community is interested in but then within our community we're also identifying who has their finger on the pulse so we have our, mm -hmm. our now we have quadruple elites your power that, users your big name fans they used to call them well right? they yeah they're they're not just the big name fans they have you know it's like i don't know if you do fantasy sports or anything like that but like the people that do it there's oftentimes a kind of people that win on a regular basis because mm -hmm. they are good enough at playing at understanding all the things that go into it. So in our community, we have people that have finished in the top 10% of film scout year after year. And so when we have, we invite them to look at screeners and help us identify IP. So now they're part of our elite scout group. We haven't announced it yet formally, but we're going to be doing a reading club called the Hollywood Readers Room where we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're identifying IP books. You know, we're not going to read Dune and movies that have already been <laughs> produced. We're going to be looking for projects that are worthy that should be produced, could be new IP or even, you know, older IP. We have some sci-fi stuff that we're optioning right now, but then our community will be helping us evaluate those projects, you know, if you're a big, you know, there's no obligation, of course, but if you're a big reader and you're also an investor in Legion M. Paul, you know, are you going to say nerd? We <laughs> oh, yeah. No, if we're, you're we're a huge all... nerd, we need your yeah. help. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If you're, well, yes, we are a legion of nerds. That's yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, awesome. So uh, the interesting thing to me about this is that, you know, I, you you hear about these ideas every once in a while and like different like i remember amazon was trying that for a minute as well and yeah with the pilots yeah yeah with the pilots and and you know to mixed success and mixed follow through frankly but the yep. thing that i'm curious about is it sounds like you've you you're trying to strike a balance between fan interaction input and data points really data points is the yep. the thing I'm, I'm hitting upon and then that kind of like you know, gut instinct, human level development work, right? Yeah. So yeah. you still have a team of people who are, are doing that sort of work and are kind of like sifting through the numbers, but they're not, it's not just like a computer spits out a receipt and says, okay, this is the movie we're making. You know, we have a team of people that have an experienced team of people. You know, Terry Luberoff is our chief operating officer, is also an entertainment lawyer and ran Eric LaSalle's com production company for many years. So, David Baxter is a screenwriter and development executive. He's been working in the industry for, you know, probably 20 plus years. So we have seasoned professionals on the team helping us, you know, decide. But they're, they're the type of professionals that also understand that the data and the input we get from our community is important. Not everyone, kind of like Moneyball, right? Like, you know, there sure. were the, 
you know, there were the, you know, recruiters that didn't want to look at the data. They just went Mm -hmm. 100% by gut. And then there are people that like, oh, well, you know, this data can be really insightful and interesting. Um, But then, you know, one other thing that's worth pointing out is we have an amazing advisory board with people like, you know, um, Tim League from Neon and Lisa Tabak from Netflix and, you know, Leonard Moulton, you know, is one of our advisors. Dean Devlin, you know, the the producer of sure. uh, mm-hmm. Independence Day. William Shatner just joined our advisory board. And so these people yeah, are, you know, when we captain have... captain of the board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's the captain of our board. Um, but, you know, these are people that we'll go to when we're like, hey, look, you know, we're evaluating the terms on this deal. And, you know, we're wondering, like, how do we, you know, how do we make the best deal? You know, like having people that we can go to that have decades of experience and are at the, you know, at that level. Um, and they're willing to, you know, sit down with us and say, okay, you've got your information here. You've got, you know, your best opinion. Here's my advice. And then we kind of take all that into consideration. You know, the goal is hopefully to make smarter, smarter and better decisions. Can I ask a random question? Sure. What does William Shatner get from being on the board of Legion M? That's a really good question. So all of our advisors get shares in Legion M. Not a lot of shares. Most of them aren't doing it. You know, we're not paying anyone. It's not a paid position. That's just not how we want to spend our money. We are willing to give them some options. And usually it's, you know, it's a pretty modest amount of options. Most of the people that get involved or 100% of the people that get involved are getting involved because they think what we're doing is really, really cool and they want it to be successful. They think it could add value to the industry. And and William Shatner, I mean, it's, you know, we, we're, we're doing a lot with him now, actually. I mean, it, he's been absolutely phenomenal for us to work with and, and a real advocate. And, you know, we now have multiple projects that we're developing with him. He's got projects that he wants to make. You know, we have projects that he could be helpful with. You know, he can make introductions for us that are, you know, really worthwhile. Does he negotiate all your hotel rooms like at Sundance? <laughs> yeah, and stuff? Exactly. He's our Priceline connection. <laughs> no, but you know what? My favorite part about William Shatner is he doesn't have an agent or a manager. I mean, you just you work oh, with him. He's got yeah, Kathleen cool. who's really uh, helpful and supportive uh, to him. But he's he's surprisingly super accessible. Mm-hmm. And really down to earth and just, you know, we met him at a Comic-Con. It's actually kind of a funny story. So David Baxter on our team, who I mentioned is a screenwriter. He's six foot eight. He's very, you know, large sure. guy. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, of me. yeah, he's, but he's a total sweetheart. And, you know, he, we were at, I think, um, Silicon here in Silicon Valley, one of the Comic-Cons up here. And um, Chatner was there and David said, hey, you know, I think I, Shatner's in the green room. You and I should just go talk to him. So we walk in there and he's sitting by himself. And it's at the end of the day. And you know, he just wants to be left alone. Like you can just sure. like, he's emanating. You're I at want a, to be left a alone. comic right. convention. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And like, we're in the I'm green room. To be where, here. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, we're <laughs> yeah. in the green room where he's getting a recipe, right? And yeah. so he's just, he's trying to, he's eating a salad or something. And, um, so we walk over and I was like, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm more like, I don't know, a little like, I don't want to bother him. You know, I just mm-hmm. want to be respectful. And, and David's like, no, 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 come on, come on. Let's just, you know, I'll just introduce you. And so he walks over and David, you know, David had met him before on the set of uh, a film and had done a project like way, way. So anyway, he said, you know, Hey, you know, Bill, you know, I don't know if you remember me, blah, blah, blah. You know, and Bill's like, Okay, guys, literally, I'm just trying to eat my lunch. You can tell his body language is just mm-hmm. emanating, leave me alone. And, you know, we, we start talking to him and David's like, yeah, you know, he's like, I just, you know, I, I want Paul to like tell you a little bit about what we're doing. So I gave him the pitch and you could just completely see as soon as we started talking about what we're doing, he, his body, everything about it changed. He was like, sure. This sounds totally fascinating. Well, as a person who understands the power of fans and fandom, yeah. 
Yeah. Yep, and there's no course. better place to have that discussion. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, well, his yeah. whole career was made by fans, you know, I mean, yeah. and, and he, he sees that. That's awesome. So obviously you get a lot of input from your investors, your board, your data yeah. scout, mm-hmm. all these different things. But can you tell us like what you, Paul, like what excites you about a project? Like what's a movie? Like, let's say one of our listeners has a amazing screenplay or project or an attachment mm-hmm. or IP. Like yep. what, what's the thing that you, you at Legion M have maybe not you personally, but what you've seen the company as a whole yeah, excited is excited about yeah. investing in. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, what, what resonates with us and I always kind of remind our team that, you know, we're not necessarily, you know, our opinion matters. Like my opinion matters but only as much as anyone else's opinion, including our investors, right? Like, mm-hmm. so ultimately, you know, we're not here to do specific, like a lot of our projects, you know, aren't projects that Paul wants to do. In fact, like I'm always sensitive to like a project that I might really love. I'll push for it, but I always say like, but guys, tell me if this is just, this is a project I love and I'm forcing it on everyone mm-hmm. else. Right. I, that's You're the like the Scanlan Chronicles. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah come on. I just think like, it's a it's good a, project. Though. It's a, just a movie about my family. And, yeah. <laughs> what, what? It's a VFX artist, cyberpunk but thriller. My high school buddies wrote a script. You know. <laughs> I would say the thing that really gets us excited is anything that's like what can be described as wildly original. Like, you know, if you look at, at Mandy, for example, you know, when we read the script for Mandy, we were like, wow, you know, this is, it's a, it's like an interesting script, but the vision for it and the lookbook was like phenomenal. And yeah, that let, was, let's talk about that. Let's un- unravel that because I think Mandy as a story is pretty straightforward, right? Super straightforward. But, yeah. but when you described it earlier as a fever dream, I think that that's a pretty common you know, descriptor for this film. It's, you know, it's neon and like there's smoke and there's double exposures and it's, it's, it's truly bonkers. Yeah. How how did that vision, is it, was it purely a lookbook? Like how did it, how did it get explained to you? How was it illuminated? It was a combination. So we were, we were pulled in by SpectraVision, Elijah Mm. Wood's company. So they, they pulled us in and, you know, we, we like their take. Like we think they do mm-hmm. interesting things. Sometimes they go a little farther <laughs> than than pretty we dark. Would go. Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They uh, yeah. like the Greasy Strangler was in that movie that we're, dude. I love the I love the Greasy Strangler. I love that movie. It's amazing, <laughs> but like I think that would be a hard movie for us to sell to our community. Well, so Mandy was a movie. Literally, we created a new sub label within Legion M for oh, cool. Mandy called Legion Midnight, and the reason we did that is because we want. We wanted to, A, kind of flag this as, hey, Mm -hmm. we don't expect everybody to love this movie, but this is a movie that is worth being, like, getting made. Like, Mm -hmm. this is a kind of, like, this is a Clockwork Orange, you know, back when Clockwork Orange was, was made. This is... You know, and we think the entertainment industry should be making movies like this mm-hmm. because, you know, now that it's out and you can see the like Mandy's got an amazing audience and, and mm-hmm. a fandom uh, around it. There are a lot of people that would claim it's the best movie they've ever seen in their life. And, you sure. know, and, and then they got is, a tattoo and they're, yep, they pull yeah. up their black T-shirt to show you. And- <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> But so, you know, that was a movie that, you know, it's it's breaking barriers, you know, like the how it was sold to us was really um there were there were a couple things. I mean, Nick Cage was a factor, of course. Mm-hmm. Panos and his movie Beyond the Black Rainbow. I don't know if you mm-hmm. ever saw that movie, which is really strange. Like, I mean, it's, you know, it's a good movie and you can see he he's very he's got he's a visionary director. But this was like a more grounded story, you know, mm-hmm. something that people people could follow and you just kind of knew Nick Cage would would embrace it and and be amazing in that role but I would say the thing that like wait was really... Nick Cage attached when you guys saw the project yeah no? yeah Nick Cage was attached when we got involved um, so that must have helped that hugely helped and um, but one of the biggest factors for me personally was um, Johan Johansson was composing the score as a heavy metal score and mm. something he had never done before. 
And that was, in fact, that was a big part of what we and what Legion M invested in. And, and one of the main reasons we got involved is we thought, you know, and, and we were right. Like that score is, I mean, we, first of all, the soundtrack is done really well. I mean, it's, you know, if, if RLJ released it, if RLJ hadn't had like ticked all the boxes for, you know, an Oscar nomination, I mean, it for sure would have gotten. So wildly original. Obviously, it helps if there's a major movie star attached. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a difference. Unfortunately, I mean, that's kind of how the industry works. What about like the budget? Scope, maybe, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that you feel like is good for business and a good size for Legion M? Or is it kind of all over? It's a really good question, Orrin. You know, it's one of the things that uh, I often remark about in, in this in the entertainment space. Like when you go buy a, you know, when you go buy a ticket to a movie, you pay the same price, whether you're going to watch Spider-Man or Mandy or a movie that was made for a million dollars, which I think is really surprising when you think about it. Like when you go out to dinner, you know, that's not how it works. You know, if someone's spending, you know, $200 million to make your dinner, you're going to pay more for that, that dinner. Well, listen Um, to this, listen to this idea. We make a hundred thousand dollar 3d IMAX movie. Mm-hmm. There yeah. you go. Twenty bucks a ticket. You play it only on forty X. Yeah, you just go. <laughs> so it's all motion controlled and stuff. <laughs> I love it. I love it. No, but well, to answer your question, I mean, we're 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 open minded on budget. You know, we've mm-hmm. you know because we're a startup and we're pretty scrappy. No one's coming to us because we've got deep pockets and we're going to finance anything. A lot of the projects that we get involved in, you know, we're not limited to, you know, we can't afford to be involved in a bigger movie. So we have actually a lot of projects coming to us. In fact, we have, we just announced that Kit Harrington uh, attached to one of our movies. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a 20 plus million dollar movie that CAA is repping, repping and, you know, will likely go to a studio to get made. And, you know, that it's exciting to be a part of a project like that. But at the same time, you know, Arch Enemy, which is up there, you know, we made that for just, you know, very, very small, you know, really super independent budget mm-hmm. film. And it looks great. You know, it What's looks super amazing. independent, like under five million or under oh, one under, million? under two million. Yeah. Under two. Million. Under two. Yeah. And when you and this we, Kit Harrington film, what does it get from Legion M? Like, is it your IP or what makes it a Legion M film? We've invested in the development of the film. So we have a mm-hmm. development investment in the script and and then some of the attachments and, and things that we're invested in now. I mean, this is part of our model is that we're now invited to participate in projects where a lot of times we'll choose to invest in a project, but it's optional. You know, like that mm-hmm. project, we probably could have gotten involved without investing anything, but we liked the ROI potential on the investment and we're very confident in the film, you know, being being financed, and once it gets financed, and we get our money back plus an ROI, but we're earning our keep as a, you know, in that project, we're not a full blown producer. There are multiple producers on the project, but we're we're we have kind of a structure which mm-hmm. is somewhere between an executive producer and a producer, where you know these are the things that we're going to do. We weren't able to pull it off because Kit has a wedding that weekend, but we were organizing to do you know, a Mary's monster panel at Comic-Con, you know, we'll mm-hmm. be kind of activating the the community and getting that grassroots mm-hmm. buzz going. And, you know, that's super valuable to other sure. producers. Sure. Yeah, yeah. no, ab- ab- absolutely. It, it, it kind of begs the question. I'm curious, Paul, just about pipeline, because it sounds yeah. like there's a handful of different ways that you find films. And I guess I'm curious of like, how do fans participate in kind of these larger maybe kind of more traditionally behind closed doors sort of deals and then also if there are any other avenues basically that that get material in front of you yeah absolutely well the the movie the true crime thriller that we produced last year is is a movie that came from one of our investors so it's it's really it's a it's a genuine authentic part of our community is to discover projects from our community Mm -hmm. hire people from our community like we're building a database so that you know like when we shot that movie and we shot it in shreveport 
and I don't remember what percentage, but a, a lot, a lot of the people we hired, they have to have lived there to get the tax credits and, mm-hmm. you know, work there. But we hired a lot of Legion M, you know, investors and members to work on the project. Um, and we're kind of, you know, and then I think we even brought in some, some people from, you know, uh, California and other areas, uh, to work on it. But as far as, you know, the pipeline, like we always felt like in the early days we were we were kind of really aggressively, you know, out there trying to find projects and convince mm-hmm. people, Hey, let us, you know, let us get mm-hmm. involved and here's what Take we'll do. Take some of our money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you'd yeah. be surprised how hard that can be sometimes. But now, you know, and, you know, and I I suspect and I hope that this will keep getting better. Now we're, you know, it's always what we wanted was to be inundated with amazing projects. Like mm-hmm. where the hardest thing for us is that we have to say no. It's hard for us to say no because we mm-hmm. fall in love with a lot of projects and we try to do a lot of things. That's why we have, you know, so many projects in our, in our slate, but you know, a lot of them, like there's another example and we're, um, we're probably going to be doing a panel at Comic-Con on this, um, where, you know, this, we have a very active Facebook group and in our Facebook group, it's open to the public, but it's mostly, you know, our investors. Mm -hmm. And every year there's been, this meme that goes around talking about this guy named Robert Smalls and Mm -hmm. people wondering, like, you know, I don't know if you've seen this meme. It usually comes out around February Black History Month where, you know, Captain Robert Smalls was a uh, enslaved man um, working on a Confederate warship during the Civil War. I mean, if you just think about that, like he was working on a ship defending the South Mm -hmm. in the Mm -hmm. war. It's just absurd. But one night in in the most audacious heist in history, he stole that ship, filled it with other family members who were also enslaved, sailed it to freedom, surrendered it. And his story is just ridiculous. So, you know, when this meme goes around, this is the type of thing that our community will latch on to and say, oh, my gosh, wouldn't it be great if Legion M could make this movie? And we see all the buzz that's happening around it because people are open and welcome to post their projects or whatever ideas for projects like that group is going all the time. And what we do, we have, you know, we we're in there as well and we have moderators. So we're able to notice like, Oh, this thing is getting a lot of attention, you know, and this one in particular just like went through the stratosphere. And so we started commenting like, Hey, you know, we don't, we don't ever want to make any promises like, Oh yeah, we'll go make that movie. It's really, really sure. hard to do. You guys know how hard <laughs> this is. Like every project that gets made is a miracle, but we say, you know, look, we'll try, like, let us, let us put some feelers out and see what we can find. And in that same thread, one of our investors who's a screenwriter and published author had said, Hey, you know, I love this story. I love it so much. I actually wrote a script. If you guys want to read my script, you know, wow. I'd be I'd be yeah. delighted for Legion M to develop it. So he sends the script over. We he had already helped. written this before this the, the Facebook group is he going. He saw the meme the year before. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I mean, probably. And so Bill Bill Duke is another one of our advisors. So we, you know, and we're developing projects with Bill, and you know, he's got really good sensibility. So we shared the script with him because we just wanted his opinion. Then he worked with the screenwriter. Now we have um, Marvin Jones involved. We have um, the Wolper organization, the the group that behind both Roots uh, series. And, you know, we're about to bring in another screenwriter to do, you know, some work on it. And it's still not like a done deal, but it's a, if, mm-hmm. if that, that's a big project. It's probably a 60 plus million dollar project. And if we produce it, It'll be absolutely the perfect, not yet. No, we haven't gone out to cast yet. We're, we're getting the script into shape. Then we'll be attaching a director and then going out to cast. But we've got some pretty good lines to some people now. I mean, one of my frustrations with the entertainment industry is just how slow everything goes. It's like incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, even a project like this, where it's very high priority, it's still slow. You know, you just, you're in, you're waiting for so-and-so's lawyer and, they got to connect with your lawyer and then one's on vacation. I mean, it's painful, but it's that lawyers are always is, on vacation. Always. <laughs> well, here's just the pitch. If you want to speed things up. Yep. William Shatner, 
as Captain Robert Small. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were going to say, Paul, that that would be the dream narrative for a Legion M project to like start yeah. in a Facebook group and, and become a, a and major go all the picture. way to a screen and become a studio project. Yeah, that would just be amazing. I think that the our listeners would kill us if I didn't dig a little deeper in terms of the ways in which people who maybe have great screenplays that aren't related to memes that are happening in the Facebook group, yeah. how do they right. get their scripts to you? Is there, is there a portal is what I'm asking or is there, is it traditional means? How does it, how does it work on that? Front? It's a really good question. At one point in time, we had a thing where you could sign up to be notified when we were kind of looking for, and mm-hmm. you know, we don't like a lot of companies. We, we try not to accept like unsolicited scripts. Sure. Just don't, you know, there are legal reasons for doing that. But we genuinely do want submission. Like today, we have to filter that or like to avoid being overwhelmed because we're a really small team and we're only like like eight people full time. Mm-hmm. So we're and we want to keep it that way. We don't want to spend all our money on staff reading scripts and everything. Sure. But we have this vision for something that we want to be able to do. We just haven't, you know, Reader's Room will be next. But uh, ultimately, we want to have a submission portal that is also, you know, people in our community can help us evaluate that content. It's like a more elaborate version than the Facebook group, right, which Mm -hmm. is just measured by likes and things like that. Um, We do actually have a pretty good program for taking scripts in and providing coverage back out to screenwriters or directors. and and going through that process and we do have projects that are that are coming to us like that and you know mm-hmm. projects so that we produce that are like it sounds that. like more through kind of traditional means like yeah what uh, i would your say lawyer your manager your agent sort of stuff yeah what i would say is the best advice that i would give anyone trying to get a project into consideration at legion m is to come see us you know like visit mm-hmm. us visit us at comic-con Visit us at, you know, if we're at South by or Mm -hmm. Sundance or Toronto Film Fest, find out where we're going to be. You know, we're out in front of people all the time. We're just at Dallas Comic Con, like, you know, not all of us, but like, you know, groups of us. And, and, um, you know, we want to be in touch and Mm -hmm. we're, we're really super accessible, you know, and, and the key is Terry and David, like, I mean, you got to get on, on their radar. Um, so meeting them and then, you know, asking for permission and sending them a script, they, we read everything that gets sent to us. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we really, why we don't just open it up because then, you know, because it it becomes an impossible task. Yeah. 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 People that are serious about it. If they are, they'll come to you. Yeah, exactly. It's a little bit of a, okay. Now what's your home address real quick. (laughs) (laughs) When you said you, you provide coverage. Like you mean like Legion M does that or through our, our team, you Mm -hmm. know, through our team. And we have a internship program where we bring in, you know, film students, we'll bring in a class of film students and usually they're earning credit in their class, Mm -hmm. but they're also learning all about the entertainment industry through Legion M. I mean, one of the things about Legion M that's kind of unique and even for our investors and our members is that we, you know, we really want to open the gates to this industry, you know, open the gates to Hollywood. And, and, you know, we're really open and transparent about, okay, here's what's happening next. You know, it's kind of like, you know, your podcast, you're telling people like, Mm -hmm. okay, you know, this is how you sell your film, or this is what a shopping agreement is versus, you know, an option. And here's how these things work. And we, you know, we do that same thing. And so our interns, you know, we teach them how to do coverage on scripts and, Mm -hmm. you know, and so a script that comes in, we usually have, you know, four, four plus people read it and provide coverage. And then we look at the consider and recommend and, you know, they'll, they'll bubble up that way. I do remember very distinctly the terror I was struck with when I was an intern at Warner Brothers, an executive came in and said to me, what What did you think of that script? And I said, I didn't like it. And they were like, okay. And then it, they didn't <laughs> literally throw it in the trash, but it certainly they were gonna. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, oh no, I'm the only person who's read this. And I just said, no. Right. And that and was I'm like uh... a flippant 19 year old snob. Yeah. The punchline to that story is that I, I said no to everything. And then one day they were like, hey, read this one, Matt. And I read it and they were like, what'd you think? 
Uh, and they were like a little more attentive than normal. And I was like, this is derivative garbage. And they yep. were like, that movie just sold for $1.5 million this morning. The um, script sold? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was called Click. And I stand mm. by my assessment. Adam Sandler? <laughs> Adam Sandler. <laughs> I'm relieved that you have more than one intern reading it. And oh, maybe yeah. don't just get a bunch of like snobs, right? <laughs> well, it is funny, you know, like my co-founder and I, he and I laugh sometimes because, you know, it is, everyone has an opinion. And all this stuff, I mean, frankly, it's so subjective. If someone reads your script and doesn't like it, I wouldn't give up, you know, because the next person might love, it, you know, and it's the same is true as for movies. That's why I really believe like, you know, having a, just a little bit more insight than you might have without it, like having mm-hmm. our community give us mm-hmm. just a little more insight. It's kind of like, you know, everybody starts off, you know, with the aim to make a great movie that will be universally appealing. But even the greatest movies have people that don't like them. Paul, thanks so much for coming to talk to us and tell us about Legion M. It sounds awesome. I mean, it, I mean, it basically sounds like you're starting your own studio <laughs> that I mean, is uh, run by fans and uh, will replace those Paramounts and Lionsgate, whatever, all the, all the little guys. I mean, if you think about it, if, if everyone invests four hundred dollars like right right now that's the average and we get to a million that'll be four hundred million dollars to invest in projects that have a million people emotionally and and financially Mm -hmm. invested in them and you know one of the things that we're fascinated and why we're so obsessed with like original ip is if if you think about the built-in audience it's the crown jewel of hollywood you know Imagine having a built-in audience that's not confined to an existing sequel or or mm-hmm. franchise, you know, it's mm-hmm. not confined to reboots and remakes, but instead looking for the next franchises. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's that's what we're trying to do. It's an experiment. You know, it's still too early to tell if we'll be successful, but you know, we feel like we're on a on a good track, and you know, we're just immensely appreciative of our community. I mean, we have people in our community that have tattooed the Legion M logo on their body, and you know, they get the Legion M personalized mm-hmm. license plate on their car. And, you know, they're, they're a part of a community that is ultimately affecting change in an industry that, that we all, you know, love. We yeah. love it, but we feel like, I mean, I don't know about you guys. There's a lot of things I'd like to change about it. <laughs> it's certainly a hobby horse of mine of like, just the idea that we've run out of franchises, right? Like mm-hmm. e- even some of the, the, the greatest of all time where it's like, Oh, we're still rehashing these movies. Yeah. And you, you look at that problem and I think that everyone kind of agrees with that more or less, right? If you take away the Marvel universe, you're pretty starved for choices in, even in the kind of the biggest, broadest, most crowd pleasing genres out there. It's like people are burnt out on star Wars. What are we doing? But if you look back on where all of those franchises began, what those roots are, right? Most of them were independent films once upon a time. Yeah, 100%. To me, it only makes sense to kind of start rebuilding, replanting those seeds again, right? So that then 30 years from now, people can get sick of our movies, right? Right. Sounds good to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) What's crazy well, is uh, well, when you mentioned that Scanline movie, Scanline fifteen. Uh, Give me a break. Yeah, when you mentioned that four hundred million dollars and how many, I was like, I wonder if there has been a movie made for four hundred million dollars. They googled most expensive movies ever made. The top five most expensive movies ever made mm-hmm. come from two franchises. Hmm. Very specific okay. franchises. Can you guys guess what they are? One's not. Is one Avatar? Nope. I'll tell you the most expensive Mission one is three hundred and seventy nine million dollars. Nope, not, and the not Mission Impossible. Of the top five is three hundred million. That's the range. And it, not Mission Impossible, not Avatar, no, not not Star Wars, no. And one of them, I think you'll get. You would guess because you already sure. mentioned it the will keep studio. Yeah, one yeah. of them is, is Marvel. a Marvel, but it's all yeah. the same Which Marvel. One? It's Avengers. Oh sure, Avengers. Age of yeah, Ultron, yeah, yeah. Endgame, and Infinity War are two, three, and four. But one in five are from the same franchise, which I don't think you Rocky. will guess. Rocky. Yep. It's Rocky. And, <laughs> no, no. What is it? <laughs> no. It's Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh. Oh, my God. On Stranger wow. Tides. Most expensive movie ever made. $379 million. Crazy. See? Yeah. Wow. 
So you know, I rewatched the first one not that long ago. It's great, actually. I don't, I can't speak yeah. for the other ones, but that first movie, it's so fun. It's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So fun. Anyway, well, Paul, we could talk yeah. about expensive movies for for days and days. <laughs> but do you have a few more minutes to hang out and endorse with us? Absolutely. Unpaid endorsements. <laughs> My unpaid endorsement is a record called The In Sound from The Way Out by Jean-Jacques Perry and Gershon Kingsley. It was one of those things where I just was putting on like weird music on Spotify and it kind of kept playing. And then I was like, what is this weird music I'm listening to? It sounds like lounge music made with a Game Boy Basically, like really, (laughs) really like just like the most primordial electronic music you could possibly fathom, but with like heavy, heavy 60s kitsch. I was like, what is going on? So I looked it up and it is one of, if not the first electronic music ever, basically. And so it's these kind of these guys who were like, what year? What's the name of the album? The In Sound from The Way Out. Uh, so I don't own it on vinyl specifically because it's one of those records that's highly fetishized. So it's been reissued a handful of times and I thought it could be yep. fun. It's frankly a little, it's more of a fun oddity than it is something that you're going to like put Can on. Can you find the, it on Spotify and stuff like that? It's all on Spotify and that stuff will yep. come up no problem. It's stuff that was recording during the 50s and 60s. But what's interesting about it is that they're genuinely trying to predict what the future is going to sound like. So they're combining what's happening in the 50s and 60s in the jazz era. They're kind of classically trained and then kind of trying to mush that all together to see into the distant future. And it sounds incredibly dated, but strangely charming and you know rudimentary in a certain way even though they have these really kind of sophisticated palettes and like a ton of training basically they're conservatory trained and all that stuff so the in sound from the way out but really any of the music of perry and kingsley will get you there you'll be like what is going on just like you know kind of like laughing but plus like a like a casio keyboard is what it sounds like anyway the weird one the in sound from the way out is my recommendation uh paul what you got sir all right. So, uh, well, I've got a couple different options. Um, the thing that I mentioned uh, that kind of came up during the pandemic is I got like pretty into gardening uh, at our sure. house. Yeah. And um, my wife is vegetarian. And so she, we eat salad every night, like with whatever we're eating and preparing for the kids, we always have salad. We just consume a lot of salad. And I found this product called lettuce grow i call it my lettuce robot it looks kind of like a robot like if you look it up the the website is lettucegrow.com and it looks like the it looks kind of like the robot from lost in space just got all these things and these like it's hydroponic and it and it uses its own water and you plug it in and it waters itself and we have one outside now and one inside where it also has you know the the uv light and I got to be, I'm telling you the thing, it's like Little Shop of Horrors, the way it grows. It's unbelievable. I cannot believe how much lettuce we get from this thing and how delicious it is. And then the one outside, we're growing cherry tomatoes. Like last year, you know, just from two little like things of soil, like it comes with a little seedling that you put in and then it grows from there. And in the span of like six to eight weeks, it grew a whole bush out on our deck with with literally probably close to a thousand cherry tomatoes off this one bush. Wow. I mean, it was un- actually there were two bushes that had grown together. I didn't realize that. So, I, you know, at the end of the season, I was taking it all apart. I was like, oh, man, there are two of them here that had grown together. They grew over like the banister on our deck, and like half the tomatoes I couldn't even get to because there were too far down and it works indoors and outdoors yeah yeah we have one indoor and one outdoor we and the indoor one you need special uv lights you can order it with lights so you can get (laughs) it with lights or without the outdoor one we only really do in the summertime uh but that's the one that grew like you know all the massive (laughs) cherry tomatoes the indoor one is just year round we mostly do like you know lettuces and spinach and stuff i mean we haven't bought grocery lettuce for you know, since we started doing it. Paul, this is legitimately cool, man. 
Yeah, this yeah. Is we give away a lot of lettuce. Like if we go out of town and we're not wait, which eating size all do you lettuce, have? Do you know? We I have the tallest one outside, and then one thirty six inches, one rung below tall uh, in our kitchen, and we keep it in the kitchen. It's the weirdest thing to like. I like it because it's like you know, it's just there and it's it's cool looking. It's I probably think. worth mentioning that this is a premium product. It's not not inexpensive. Well, if you eat salad every day, <laughs> do you eat sixteen hundred dollars worth of salad? <laughs> it's of probably break even. I got it for my wife for for Mother's Day, or Mother's mm-hmm. Day and her birthday are the same day frequently, mm-hmm. um, and so it was like a, a gift for her. But now you know I tend to it, and and I don't mind. Like I have, a, I also have a garden. I like just putting podcast on and you know, tending to the garden or even sometimes when I'm on a conference call, I'll just be out there, you know, noodling around out there. But when, and what, I, what, what happened is I, I've had both of them for probably like two years and the prices have doubled since I, yeah, since sure. I got it. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I don't know. I mean, everything's doubled. It's just crazy how expensive. Wait, and why, and you need to plug it into electricity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You plug it in. Yep. 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 What, and what is the electricity for? Well, it, it's got a pump inside. So you fill, so if you live in California, it's important. It recirculates the water. So you fill the tank and it's got uh, a pump that pumps the water up through and then you put nutrients into the water periodically. Um, and then you, you know, eventually some of the water or the water will evaporate. So you have to refill it, but it takes a while for that to happen. The actual unit itself has gotten really kind of expensive the seedlings aren't bad they're only like 250 a seedling i've filled our whole kitchen table with a, just a mound of salad before and we bag it up and give it to neighbors and friends and stuff i mean it is hilarious anyway that's my unpaid endorsement i guess for listeners at home it's like imagine like again kind of like a 60s pot that's like you know uh, three four six feet tall depending on the size that you get with like holes where uh, plants are kind of growing out of the sides, uh, but it's kind of this cool, like white, plasticky sort of looking thing. Very futuristic. Looking. Yeah, it looks yeah. like a lost in space situation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Paul, what's your other endorsement? I mean, if if we're talking film, you know, any any filmmakers out there that are that haven't been indoctrinated on the films of Louis Bunuel, you know, I would recommend going back. I became kind of like a Louis Bunuel fanatic when I was in, in college. I don't know if you guys have ever watched any of the early, you know, and on delusion, uh, some of those movies, but I would say that's, you know, I, I haven't revisited that in, in a little while. I still have uh, a lot of the, I have them in VHS. <laughs> yeah, man. Which is hilarious. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think there's stuff to, to be learned from early Louis Benoit. Kaplan, what you got, buddy? It's kind of like a, a hack slash warning. So, I, you know, a lot of listeners know I was selling my iMac and um, I sold it to someone and I told them they can just pay me over Venmo. And I told them my username is Oren Dash Kaplan on Venmo. And they sent the money to Oren Kaplan without the dash. <laughs> Oh, no. So one word of warning. First of all, if you send money to someone on Venmo, it is irreversible. Whoa. It's not like even like Zelle or uh-huh. writing a check or using a it's credit like card. It's wire, like wiring somebody money. Yeah. yeah. It is irreversible. So Oren Kaplan, who is not me, <laughs> got the money <laughs> got from money. my iMac. And this person sent Oren Kaplan a message and said, hey, I sent the money to the wrong person. She requested the money back and he denied the, the request. <laughs> I'm so disappointed to hear that. Yeah, that yeah. sucks. And she was like, well, karma, okay, whatever. But yeah. so the interesting thing uh, today, I found out she money. did get the money back. But what she did, because Venmo, uh, you know, a lot of your transactions are public, like a mm-hmm. social media money exchange sure. yeah, yeah. platform. She went to all the people that he had exchanged money with and she sent them each one dollar. <laughs> she was like, hey, can you tell your friend Orin <laughs> to give me back my money? I accidentally sent it to the wrong Orin Kaplan and he won't. So she send just it back. shamed him. Oh, she shamed him. I yes, love it. Yes. And I somehow got connected with his mom. Yeah. Who was like, you yeah, give the money back. So yeah, she got the money back, <laughs> yeah. but she used the 
respect um, lovers yeah. of social media social, social platforms justice. i love to it to achieve yeah so anyhow that's wow. a great hack that's and interesting got, and clever paid. but also yeah. she sent i thought it was interesting that she because i was like maybe you can contact some of these people but i thought it was interesting that she contacted them with a dollar which is very easy in, mm-hmm. in venmo world that's the the language of venmo is dollar sure. yep. yeah yeah that's <laughs> a dollar I'm glad it ended well, though. Well, awesome. Well, Paul, where should people follow you? We can be found at legionm.com. It's really easy. L-E-G-I-O-N-M.com. And our, our handles on social are Legion M official uh, pretty much across the board. And by the way, it's worth mentioning, we don't require people to invest to get involved. And it's something that we feel strongly about. You know, as I mentioned before, we, we pretty much talk people out of investing more than they can afford. We never want that to happen. But we also don't want investing to block people or Mm -hmm. you know people to feel like they have to invest to get to know what we're all about so you can join for free and and sign up and come to our events and play film scout be a part of impulse and all the things that we do and then later if you decide to invest that's great if you don't and you just want to be a part of the community and the movement that's fine too so we have over 150,000 people that are in the community today and about 35,000 of them are invested. Well, if you want to follow us, we are at Just Shoot a Pod uh, across all social media. You can email us at justshootapod at gmail.com. Tweet at us. We'd love to hear your thoughts or email us and let us know what you think about Legion M. You know, we're happy to send to forward your thoughts on to Paul. You can find me. I'm on Instagram at OKaplan. I'm at Smitey Pileg on Twitter. And I'm at Mr. Matt Enlow across all social media. This episode was edited by Noah Bayshore. Thanks, Noah. You can find him at Noah Bayshore with a Y uh, across social media. I'm sure he would love the follow. He's doing great work. And you're listening to music provided by the Fee Music Archive and the artist Jazar. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.